As Brother Galen said, it is good to see everyone out on this nice, warm winter day. Hope that you have enjoyed what snow we had. I'm sure our kids enjoyed that snow day Friday. Uh, a little adventurous getting around town, a little tricky, but uh, all in all, we seem to have all made it well. But those visiting with us again, we count you as our honored guests. And hope every opportunity that you have to be with us, you will come and, and be with us. I want this morning to go to the book of Ephesians. And before I get into the lesson, a fourfold picture of the church, as I have studied through the years and read through the book of Ephesians, the whole book of Ephesians deals with the church. And it deals with all these different aspects of the church. But I think this morning as I think about the church, I understand that the church is important to God, our Father. It is important to Him because the church was eternally planned. It was something that God put in motion before the very first words of creation were ever spoken. Before the very foundation of the world, the church was planned. But I know that it was divinely purchased. And when I think about the divinely purchase of the church, I can't help but to think of the love God had in sending His Son to die on the cross. But not only is the church important to the Father, the church is important to Christ, the Son our Savior. It was so important to him that in Matthew, he says, I will build my church. He promised it. He told those in that day that the church was coming and that he was going to build it. And because he promised it, he even went so far as to purchase the church and when I think about how he purchased the church, the book of Acts says that he purchased it with his own blood. The very sacrifice that we just remembered paid for the church. It paid for our sins which are forgiven through his blood which allows us to become part of his body. And so as we look this morning at the book of Ephesians, I want you to see that the church is shown as a fourfold picture in the book of Ephesians. And we'll be in the book of Ephesians the entire morning. We won't be uh, going out of it. But first of all, notice that the church is pictured as a body that is reconciled, or a body under Christ that's reconciled to God. Look at Ephesians chapter 1. Verse 22 and verse 23. It says, And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. The church is a body which is subject unto Christ in all things. If you go back again to the book of Matthew, you will see the very last words of the book of Matthew. Jesus says, all authority has been given unto me in heaven and on earth. Jesus says, I have the authority. Therefore, the church which I purchase is subject to me. And it is only subject to him because of what God did in allowing us to be at peace because we have been reconciled to God. If you go back into the Old Testament, back to Genesis chapter 3, you will remember the passage there about what event took place. You will remember that God gave Adam and Eve one very simple command. And that command was, you can have everything you want in the garden except one thing. The day you eat of the fruit of that tree that's in the midst of the garden, God said, you shall surely die. Well, we know what Adam and Eve did. Adam and Eve partook of that fruit. And when they partook of that fruit, they separated themselves from God. 
But you and I, as part of his church, we can have peace knowing that Jesus came and reconciled us back to the Father by allowing us to be part of his church. But not only that, it is also a body that is at peace with itself. And you might say, Brother Ray, what do you mean that the church can be is at peace with itself? We are at peace in the church because of what Jesus did for us. But secondly, this morning, if you go to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 20, you will notice that the church is a building that's resting upon a divine foundation. Notice what it says. It says in Ephesians 2 and verse 20, Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. When one looks at any religious body, what is the most important thing to look for? What is the number one key that you must look for in any type of religious body? I think you need, first of all, the most important thing is you need to see that that church is resting on the foundation of Jesus Christ. And someone says, well, Brother Ray, how can we know that someone is building on that foundation of Jesus? And I forgot to do this this morning, and I did it on purpose. You've heard me state week after week after week after week, if you're visiting with us and you see or you hear something that you don't understand in our worship service, then we simply ask you to ask us and we'll provide a Bible answer. Brethren, when one looks at religious organizations, they must look to the New Testament revelation to make sure that the church is built upon the foundation of Jesus Christ and the teachings of the New Testament. In other words, one must go to the source of authority the foundation. Jesus said, I will build what? My church. It's something that exclusively belongs to him, not some avenue of a human. And so when I think about this divine foundation, I also see that it must not rest on human wisdom. Someone says, well, what about what, what's wrong with human wisdom? Nothing. But the human wisdom needs to come and understand the wisdom of God. We need to take what God has said in His Word through the revelation of the Holy Spirit. And we need to make application of that. And we need to filter that through what Christ taught in His earthly ministry. By the way, someone says, well, Jesus didn't teach on a lot of subjects. Well, just because He didn't teach on it doesn't mean He didn't give us a principle of what it meant. If you look at the life of Christ all throughout the gospel record, you will see that Jesus laid the principle of what was in the past of the, under the old law and what was expected under the new law by which the church should be and is governed. We will see Jesus lays out these principles. You remember he says, you have heard of old that it is said such and such, but now I say to you this. And so on and so forth. If you go to the book of John chapter 4, perhaps you remember that passage. If you want to turn there, go ahead. You remember Jesus is traveling, and he stops at Jacob's well as he's traveling through Samaria. And there he meets the Samaritan woman, and he asks her for a drink. And she says, who am I? Why are you asking me? Don't you know that's not acceptable? Jesus goes on to tell her, if you really knew who I was taught, who I am, that I have something better to offer, that if you drink of this living water, that you would never thirst again. And the woman realized and recognized the fact that Jesus was not a Samaritan. And she looks at him and she says, You know, you Jews, you worship your fathers in your place. And we Samaritans, we worship what? Our fathers, 
our gods. We worship them in our places. And what did Jesus say? He said there's coming a day when that won't make a difference. Why? Because Jesus was going to unite both Jew and Gentile into one body built upon this divine foundation. You see, Jesus speaks of the foundation to the woman at the well. Because he goes on and he says, the day is coming when one who worships God will worship him in spirit and in truth. But number three this morning, as I think about this fourfold picture that Paul is painting in the book of Ephesians, it is a church making known God's wisdom. Brother Costell read for us that passage in Ephesians chapter 3, beginning in verse 9. He says that we are to make all people see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Christ Jesus. Notice verse 10. To the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. Did you see what he said? Did you understand what Paul says about making known the wisdom of God? How does the church do that? It does it very simply by its existence and how it came into existence through Jesus. Noting the fact here in those verses that it was according to what? The eternal purpose. What does that mean? God always had a plan. God had a plan all throughout the ages about making known His wisdom. Someone says, well, Brother Ray, why didn't you do it earlier? I don't know. You can ask him. Why didn't, he, why didn't he do it under the old law? Why didn't he do it from the beginning of time? Well, I have my thoughts. It's my wisdom. Remember, the church is built on God's wisdom, not human wisdom. But as I look at the Old Testament and see how those folks lived in the, that day, the purpose of the Old Testament for me is so that I might see God working through the lives of people who had faith in knowing God had made promises and that God will fulfill the promises that he made. That's this manifold wisdom of God. How that one would see from the existence of the church. How it exists in this world and how it came into being. God's wisdom can be expressed. But what about the operations, one says? The manifold wisdom of God can be seen in how the church operates. And you can think about how the church operates. How is the church structured? Who is the head of the church? Christ is the head, right? We are the body. In the church, in its perfect form, would have elders, deacons, and so on and so forth. You see, God says, here's how the church should operate, but what is, what is the primary focus of the church? Let me rephrase it. What should be the primary focus of the Lord's church? Should it not be, as Jesus said in Luke chapter 19 and verse 10, where he says that he came to seek and to save that which was lost? Isn't that why he says that we are to go into all the world and preach the gospel, teach all nations, all men, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then we are to continue to teach? Isn't that what the church, isn't that the purpose of the church? He said, that's our primary focus. But the church, by its operation, we need to understand the principle of evangelism. We need to understand the principle of being benevolent, being giving. And we need to understand, thirdly, the importance of edification. 
You see, when I think about the Great Commission, I can see all of those things being built into what Jesus said. Go, teach, that's evangelize. Benevolent is using the means you have to share the message. <coughs> and then at the end of that verse, it says what? You continue teaching. That's edification. <coughs> you see, none of us that are here, no matter how old you are, no matter how long you've been a member of the Lord's Church, none of us will ever know all of God's wisdom. Never. And someone says, well, I know so-and-so, and they're pretty smart. Yeah, well, maybe they are pretty smart. But if you went up and you asked them if they knew everything, they would say no. You see, that's why we're here. We're here to edify, to build up one another, to continually teach one another so that we may grow, so that we can dig and feast on the meat of what God's Word is. But number four this morning, when I think about the fourfold picture in Ephesians. I see the church as a glorious wife married to a loving husband. In Ephesians chapter 5, just look at verse 22 and down through verse 32. And I'm, I'm not going to read all of these things, all of these verses. Wives, submit to your own husband as to the Lord. For he is the head, the husband is the head of the wife, also is Christ the head of the church. And you continue on down, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church. The glorious wife is loved by the husband. Jesus loves his bride, the church. <laughs> It goes on and it teaches us in verse 26 that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. When I think about that sanctification, that is the purifying, that is the setting apart of each individual. How does he do it? When he speaks there about the fact that it is with the washing of water. Paul, what are you speaking of? I believe Paul was speaking of water baptism. I believe he's speaking of baptism. And he goes back, if you go back to Paul's other writings in the book of Romans chapter 6, he talks about how we are baptized where? Into the death, the burial, and into the resurrection of Jesus. Why? So that our sins might be washed away. Or maybe we need to go back over to Galatians chapter 3 and look at verse 26 and verse 27 where it says that every one of us who has been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. You see, the only way that we can be part of this loving church, this glorious wife to this loving husband, is to be part of it. And the only way we can be part of it is to be married with him. Married with him in baptism. Someone says, well, that's not right, Brother Ray. But isn't that really what it is? Aren't you being married when you are married to Christ? Because you're putting to death the old man and you're putting on the new man in Christ. And the church ultimately obeys the husband. So as I think about this fourfold picture this morning, it comes up and I have a few questions for you to answer. First of all, are you a member of his body? His body, the one true church that he purchased and that he promised. Are you a living stone in the building that's built upon the chief cornerstone, the correct foundation? Are you part of his called out assembly, the church? And then you look at the last one where it says, are you married to him? <coughs> You're married to him when you are buried with him. I thought about that for a long time, how I wanted to say that. You know, I, and I've been preaching a long time. And it really never occurred to me that that is really what you're doing. When you are baptized into Christ, 
It is just like you are taking the vow at your wedding service. Because what you're really saying is to Jesus and to God, I'm committed. I'm committed <coughs> to you till death do us part. This morning, where are you at? Are you in the body? Do you need to become a member of the body? You can do that this morning by leaving the way of the world, repenting of sin, come and make the confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, the one who shed his blood and purchased the church, which you could be a part of by being buried with him in the water and grave of baptism, where your sins will be washed away. Or have you done that and your life just hasn't been what it should be and you need to come home this morning? Whatever your need is, our prayer is you make your need known by coming to the front right now while we stand and while we sing.